welcome back to another session of uh, Table Talk with Chef Pao. I am very glad, honored, and privileged to have a very special guest, a good friend and our partner in training. We want to welcome Walter Kunert of AIDA Cruces. Thank you very much, Paolo. I'm also very happy to be here in your podcast. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, this, uh, this hour, hour and a half, however long we're going to talk. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Walter. Uh, this is very important time and very important uh, opportunity for us to talk about the cruise ship industry amidst the pandemic. However, before we start, you know, please tell us briefly about yourself. We want to know who you are. Yes, my name is Walter. Um, I work for Ida Cruises since 2006. And uh, my journey started in the tourism and hotel industry uh, in about 92. So I first did an apprenticeship in hotel management in the Mercure Group, Accor. And then I worked for some years in different resorts uh, with, uh, with Robinsons and uh, different kind of hotels and resorts. Mm -hmm. I also did some special work for like Jaguar, General Motors, uh, around uh, car racing and uh, so different, different fields in the tourism. And uh, then I started studying marketing East Asia, specialized on Japan, uh, on the East Asian Institute. And I'm a big advocate of working and learning at the same time. So I studied and then I continued to work and uh, I would continue to do this uh, until this day. So every year or at least every second year I'm doing another degree or I'm doing another course and it's always parallel. Mm -hmm. And then in about 1990, yeah, 1999 was the first time I got on, in, in touch with cruise ships. Because I have a, sp a sports background and I played semi-professional basketball and uh, different, you know, been a lifelong martial artist and so on. So I uh, got a job uh, between semesters on the Carnival Fantasy at that time as a personal trainer. Mm -hmm. And so that was my start into the cruise ship industry and then it kind of, it, it hooked me. And since then I've been involved in the, in the cruise ship industry, so I worked on different cruise lines. And uh, yes, and then since 2006 I'm working for Ida. I remember 2015 that uh, we had the cruise convention. And up to this day, that speech of yours gave me goosebumps, you know, and uh, it's a... Uh, it's a powerful message and I remember your talk about you being dyslexic and uh, you were able to to cover up all the hardships in your regular schooling. Can you talk about that for a, for a quick bit? When I was in, in, in regular school, I, I had very bad grades. And um, so I was born in 1973 and the time when I went to school, they had different methods and methodology of, of how they would school and how they would learn uh, or teach better in, in school. And those teachings had an impact because if you're dyslexic, uh, there was a time that didn't, you didn't study the ABC, you would study whole words. So there was this concept of uh, a different learning concept and that made my condition. I mean, if you're dyslexic, you already struggle sometimes with words, you're twisting words. Right. Um, sometimes the B and the P is the same, or the F and the V. And so that, that gave me even more difficulties. And so my grade- Like when you do, you, of course, as a kid, you will feel like you're, not, you're slow, you know, people look at you differently. You know, emotionally, it's hard, it's tough. Well, in, in, I'll give you an example. If you, if you have one page, I would write a, a A4 one page. I would have 50 to 60 mistakes in it. Wow. And, and then somebody would correct those mistakes. I look at them. I, let's say I learn them. I would memorize the mistakes. 
and then I would write exactly and then I would uh, memorizing how to write it correctly and then I would write the same paper again and then those 50 mistakes would be gone but I would have another 50 that I did previously correct oh my god so what happens is it becomes very confusing because you almost want to compensate by just memorizing things so what I would do, if I would have to write an essay, I would, I would memorize the whole essay, how to spell it. So I wouldn't spell it by normally how you just go through the words and you spell them. I would write it pure out of memorization so that I wouldn't make all these mistakes. But if I would have to write out of a flow by just writing something new, then I would make, again, a lot of mistakes. But they would never be the same. It would always be a different mistake. So then I went to a special school where they checked and I had some exams and they realized that, that uh, it's a mild form of dyslexia. And then I had after school, I had school after school to help with it, to at least pass school because a couple of times I didn't pass the grade, so I had to redo the grade. And, um, yeah, and then there was a very profound moment um, in 1991. I went to, to America, I went to high school in America. And in, uh, because I'm a, I'm a sports person, so uh, all of a sudden when I was in the US, then I, I was in the high school team and I was in the basketball team, the track and fields, um, also the cross country. And in order for me to, to stay in the teams and to participate on the games, I had to have a certain grade point average. Yeah. And so that gave me extra motivation to learn. But what I realized, I had to learn things differently. Okay. And so I was about 18 years old and I started learning how to learn based on how I learn best. And I realized that the way I learn best is immersion learning. Immersion learning. Immersion, meaning getting all my senses engaged. So for example, if I would have to learn something about history, instead of reading a whole book about it, I would look for a movie or a documentary, let's yeah. say Hamlet. So let's, I remember when I had to study Hamlet in school, I looked at the movie from Mel Gibson, Hamlet. <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. and so all of a sudden things become much clearer for me because this way I would be able to, to learn much faster. And I realized if I change the, the learning, I can learn so much more because, right. of, because as a dyslexic, your, your brain is a little bit wired differently. That mm -hmm. means you're able to connect huge amount of information actually fairly, fairly f fast and you can learn okay. it. You just have to teach it differently or you have to learn how to learn it differently. All right. And that's kind of how it started. So I think, Walter, I just wanted to point out that when you, uh, when you learn and experience all of uh, uh, the hardship, I remember the point that you wanted to stress is that you want the people to learn how to learn i remember that vividly and in your case that that uh if you may say disadvantage early on in learning that difficulty led you to understanding how to learn better adapting to your style to your ways and i guess that what's making you very successful in training other people as well so uh, in your in your own perspective, that kind of uh, experience w was able for you to to be able to uh, to transfer that kind of knowledge and that kind of system to others. Were you able to to grasp that learning and to find new training methodologies on how to be more effective? Uh, yes, what, what happens is the difficulties, you overcome the difficulties by being more creative and you have to think of different ways. And that's one of the things that, that I learned in, uh, then later on in the school that you have to, but the school system I can't change, so I have to change, I have to adapt myself. Right. But then later on I was looking 
because I started coaching basketball as an assistant coach when I was 15 years old. So by the time I was 18, I already took over a team. And it's the same thing. I had to adapt. It's the same when you play basketball. You, you study, you study the opponent, and then you, you, you train in the best ways that you can overcome the adversity which would be there in the next team. And so I looked at everything in life uh, adversity gives you the opportunity to be creative, to adapt, and then you overcome. And that makes you stronger because it makes you realize, wait a second, whatever obstacle there is, there's always a solution to it. I just don't find it. I, I don't know it yet. So it's that drive and quest for finding the solution to overcome the obstacle. And that's later on when I started going into training and coaching. So I was always in training and coaching, also as a personal trainer, but it wasn't that clear to me until I became a coach and a trainer for the cruise ship industry, because then I realized it's the same thing. And that's when I started looking into other alternatives. So I became an NLP trainer. What's NLP? A neurolinguistic programming. Yeah, that's a lot of words and yeah, uh, that's like how do mean? you how do you program your brain through through work? Neuro linguistic programming. So how you program your your mind with words. Alright. So uh, just just I remember uh, I always want to bring this up since you talked about basketball. I know that you've played with Jason Kidd and uh, he learned a lot from you or is it all <laughs> <laughs> very nice, very good joke. Well, I, uh, the good, first of all, uh, the, I never played with him because um, they, they whooped us. So I had the opportunity when I played in high school, uh, we had different tournaments and uh, so we, we played uh, against uh, um, you know other teams who were who who were. This is in the states, of course, right? This so was in the United state? States, yeah. So I, I was outside of Kansas City, uh, okay. and there was a, a tournament, and so I had the opportunity to to be to get a whooping uh, <laughs> from from the team. Well, I thought he learned from you guys, but nevertheless, let's talk about your cruise in, cruise ship. Uh, is the nature of your work in the cruise ship industry training? Correct. I'm the training manager for AIDA, for AIDA, and that means I'm in charge of all the trainings outside the EU. All the trainings outside of EU, Correct. so that includes Philippines, the Philippines Indonesia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and so on. How, how did your career started in the training? I mean, I, I, you, you, talked about, uh, you talked about the basketball, you learn, you know, uh, NLP, but when did you start really training in the cruise ship industry? Um, we see, when, when I was working on the cruise ships, uh, after my first contract, I got promoted to manager. And part of being a manager on cruise ships is training. So uh, you constantly have to train HES, health environment, safety, security. Uh, you constantly have to do sales training, service training. So the moment you're a manager on cruise ships, a big part of being a manager on cruise ships is, is training. So my, my training background in coaching and training, of course, helped me tremendously because that wasn't something new. That, that came almost natural to me because I've been doing it since I'm 15 years old. Yeah. It was just a different field, but the content may change, but, but the thinking of how to train and how to teach people, uh, that, that is a system in itself. And the content can be replaced, but you gotta have a, a system, a methodology on how you're gonna deliver trainings, how you want people to change behavior. Let's, let's be honest, when we're talking about training, we're also talking about behavioral change. Because yeah. you want one person to do something different because you see maybe that's a negative outcome and you want to change that into a positive outcome. So we're talking about behavioral changes. So how do you change behavior of people and, and to have a better outcome, either for themselves or for the organization or for the team? And so that's kind of how I got started. And then... Um, when in 2006 I applied to work for AIDA, they were looking specifically for a training manager. So I got hired by AIDA as a training manager that would go from ship to ship. So my task was to stay on each ship for about four weeks to train every department in everything you can think of, from service to sales, customer complaints handling, presentation. 
anything. So I would always look, what's the objective of the company? What's the objectives of the ship? And what is it that the crew members need in terms of training to fulfill these objectives? Okay. So I would stay four weeks on one ship, train, then go to the next ship, four weeks, the next, the next, the next. And that's kind of how I got started. And then we realized we need to train more and more crew because we're growing as a cruise line. So the logical conclusion was let's train the crew members before they come on board because right. then it's much more effective and efficient. Correct. Because on the ship, they got to perform and there's a little bit time to train. I remember 2018, uh, I think it's 2008 or nine. the first time I met you, this was when I was teaching in a class and you came in in one of the classrooms. It was the first time I guess I met you and um, you were um, visiting with this another German guy and the first time I saw you, you know, and uh, I think that was the beginning of the straining shoreside in the Philippines. It's been a long time since that. Uh, it's a decade you know, and uh, a decade and two years and for me, that training that uh, you made and uh, what we do is is so important in not just preparing the person to go on board to work, but also to make that person succeed and perform uh, in the organization, in the cruise ship, and be uh, valuable in the operations. So in that decade or more, how can you say that it has changed? I mean, the importance is there, but from you as the one who delivers the training and see how it is uh, being measured as a success factor on board, how do you connect training and uh, those success factors? The first time I came to the Philippines was 2007 and, and I did a little trial training with five people, just a flip chart, a pen and five people, uh, just to kind of get a feeling of, you know, what is it here, how is the setup, what's the environment like. And then I came the second time again, I think six months later to do, to do another trial training and then we decided and I think it was September 2008 when I moved completely over here and I said let's make this the base here mm -hmm. and then from here distribute the training all over Asia, all over our training schools. And what happened is of course when, whenever I started a new country I first had to kind of get an idea what is it that the crew members are bringing in. It's like, wh where are they? Um, I would say that's teaching the gap. So it's to first identify what is the yeah. gap that's missing for the crew members to be successful on the ship. And that gap is different for every person, for every country, uh, for every culture. And, and to okay. identify that, ca that gap. At the beginning, I didn't know much about those gaps because you can't read that in a book. Because, oh, yeah. because times are evolving and People are not the same two years later, cultures are not the same, especially That's in Asia true. because the, the economies, the, the culture, everything moves so fast in Asia. Absolutely. And therefore it's so critical to really stay on the ground, to, to talk to people, to identify what's that gap. So if you look at our training when we started in 2008 until today, the training is not the same anymore. It has, yeah. it has evolved tremendously. Through, through the years because we constantly had to adapt and <clears throat> identify what's the new gap, what's the new challenges. Because of course we have an outcome in mind, like what would be the way the crew should perform on the cruise ship. But even those expectations from the ships change. New situations, like now we're in a pandemic, so that creates new situations. So also over the year when we grow, and we're scaling up the training, we also have to attest for the scaling because it's different if you train 20 people a year or we're training 3,000 people a year. How do you make sure the trainers are all on board? They all have the same mentality. They, they know how to teach what we want to teach. So the whole system is, is a constantly evolving um, 
system and that we constantly have to update. And I think there is not one way how to teach it. It's more like how do you adapt the system over the years with all the variables and then identify the variable and see which ones you can control and which ones you cannot control. And I think that's, that's the biggest uh, challenge for training, is that ability to evolve and, and uh, to identify. Walter, we, we said that uh, you know, you, the importance of training and how it has evolved. Correct. If, if, if you look at this, let's say we, we talked about the gap, right? So let's say you identified the gap of the person that you want to train. What is the person, you know, or what, do, what do they not know, but you want them to know and then be able to perform uh, on, on the ship or in any other aspect of life, for example. So let's say you identify that gap. Then you have to figure out where is that person coming from? Uh, what is the base knowledge and how do you, how do you teach now? Because that's the methodology. And the tricky part is, if a person comes into the training, ideally there should be a different person when they come out. What I mean by this, I give you an example. Let's say we talk about safety. And safety, I think the key is in safety is not to teach procedures, but to make sure you, you install a safety mentality into the person. So that they're doing something not because it's a procedure or somebody told them to, but because they realize it's the best thing to do to get a certain outcome, right? So if you want to be safe with a motorcycle, you would wear a helmet. Now the question is, should you wear the helmet because the police officer will fine you if you don't wear it, or should you wear it because it helps you to protect your own head? So that's the different one is you do it because you're either threatened or punished or you know there's some kind of authority that makes you do this but you don't really believe in it you do, you're not doing it because you 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 really want to protect your head so you're just doing it to avoid punishment now that is not something that we want because we want the person to really understand why this is important and how do you protect yourself when, you, when you're with a motorcycle. So one is what I would call a safety mentality and the other one is just merely compliance. And that's two different things. I understand that and I believe that wholeheartedly. It's been the ethos of what we do here in Mika also right. what we train is understanding the why more than just following compliance. And that's again one of the question that always I always ask you, of you is because you know, when, when everything starts to become difficult and when everybody's trying to, to, to find ways to cut cost and then they will always look at training as the first one to go. This is a very simple question, but like I said, you, you have a very a simple direct answer to that. Like when you, when you talked about health and safety, another a person will come up on board a different state of mentality that spells the difference of whether you will fail or you will succeed in your own personal view and the way you connect training to key factor for success is there any measurement that would be able to say hey your training made are successful in operations of course you you can you can split it into different parts one is for example the whole safety aspect so health environment safety security the training is directly connected by having less accidents on board uh, safer environment uh, the, the whole hygiene, of course, is critical. I mean, it's critical now, but it was always critical. It was always important that people don't get sick on the ship. And uh, so hygiene is critical. So the, the connection is it makes the ship safer. It makes the crew be more aware of how to avoid accidents, how to avoid making mistakes. Uh, so that's one connection. But then there's the second part, and that's the guest. Because we're, we're in the cruise industry, we're in the tourism industry, so there's all these kind of KPIs on how happy are the guests and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a direct connection with the training of the crew and the, the happiness and the service standards on the ship. So the, the better the crew is trained, the better they can just deliver the service, the better the guests are happier. 
and, and they feel good. So there's that emotional um, outcome, but there's also an outcome in, in hard numbers. It means the guest satisfaction rate just goes up by, through the trainings. So it's on every aspect of the operation, either safety, environment, hygiene, uh, or if it's guest service, but it also is important for the happiness of the crew themselves. Yeah, that's true. Because then they feel confident to, to go to the ship, to face the guest. Why? Because they're trained, they're confident, they feel good about themselves, and so it's easy for them to make other people feel good. Yeah, and they went through the motions. They went through the motions. I always talked about this with you like in any sport why 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 are the people doing drills why are they practicing why are they like even if in MMs, MMA or boxing why do they have to spar why do they have to train if you put someone there who has never been trained never been you know it, definitely for sure that performance will never be compared comparable to those that who have been trained and trained properly I, I always give this example because I know I, I mean I do martial arts uh, I do weights bodybuilding I've been doing sports all my life everything is training okay and the, the thing is the only way to become bigger and stronger is by not to be afraid of failing because every single training you will fail Right. Okay, there, there's always an amount of weight I will not be able to lift, but I'm not afraid to, to try to lift it. So, <laughs> in the end, you either lift it or you don't, because in my philosophy, there's no such thing as trying. You can't try something. Trying is failure. So, either you lift something or you don't lift it. And the only way to find out if you can lift it is by lifting it. And then you will find out either you lift it or you don't. And if you don't lift it, you need to train harder so that you can lift it. And this is a very simple logic, but it applies to every aspect of life. You're never going to go into a UFC cage just by reading martial arts from a book, right? You, you would get your butt kicked so bad that uh, if you come out a lot or get a, or get a black belt at the uh, highest level of dan but not the black belt you know that's all you're going to get so that's that's why training is is critical in every aspect if it's look at the i mean i'm look at military military is is 95 percent training exactly it's always be ready for the worst case scenario and and that's that's the critical airlines it's all about training tourism service industry firefighters police officers we have this debate now about police and so on training 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 this it's all about training the better somebody is prepared the better they are the, the more confident they are and the better decisions they will do under pressure why? Because they've been in situations. My philosophy was always in, in sports, train harder than the game and the game will become easy. But if, if you're doing half measures in your training and then the person gets under pressure in the real situation, they're going to crumble. So prepare them even, even more than what maybe in the worst case scenario will come in the reality. So that when the situation comes, people are prepared and, and the likelihood of them making better decisions is, is so much higher, so much higher. Yeah, in, in, my, in my world, we call it mise en place. I mean, we die in, we die in, in preparing, in preparation. We smile in service time. We succeed in the, day, in the operation if we're prepared. And to me, that's what preparing is. That's what training is. So now that you've talked about the, the training and its importance, I want to talk about, you mentioned about the COVID with this, the whole, the whole idea of why we're doing this. So we know that, you know, cruise lines are greatly affected by COVID. The whole tourism industry airline is affected. But before we go there, how did it affect you personally? And if you can share a bit of your, uh, you know, the personal side and, and then what happened to you? Well, uh, you know, when it, I, I was still in, in, in January, I was in Taiwan, and then in February I was in Miramar, we were still teaching in Miramar, and, and then all of a sudden the word came out and, and the situation got worse, and then there was, 
the possibility of visas getting uh, revoked, uh, airlines are closing down. Uh, Crazy time, huh? So, so I had to make a decision at the time, do I stop the trainings and sending the trainers back home to the Philippines uh, or, or are we going to continue? So I realized the situation became more and more chaotic so I immediately uh, stop the training, send all the trainers home, so the trainers were able to come home in time and uh, be with their family and, and prepare. And then I came back here to the Philippines from Miramar, and I realized uh, it's, it's, uh, they're going to cancel all the flights. So I was immediately getting a flight uh, back to Germany, and, and in March I went to Germany, and, and then what happened is um, I, I was stuck. I was stuck in Germany because uh, all of a sudden, all visas got got revoked and flights and everything was done. And so then I was in Germany for, um, the, I think, five months almost, or almost six months. And until I finally were able to, to, to get a visa to, to come back here to the Philippines, because we knew we had to prepare. We knew we had to ramp up our training, our system. To, to for a new start. We know this will not last forever and so therefore we have right. to be prepared for what's coming. Right. And that's why then I was able to come back here and, and then you know we talked and we said so how can we now support the restart of the cruise industry from a training perspective because it was clear that training will be an absolutely vital and most in a very important part because now standards have changed, systems have changed, yeah. even service has changed. And, and of course, we need to make sure uh, the crew members that are now on the ships or that they're going on the ship, they're familiar with the new standards, with, with all the hygiene rules and regulations to make sure that the guests and crew, everybody is 100% is safe. Yeah. And the only way to do this is training. So it always goes back to the same thing because what you don't know, you don't know. So somebody got to teach you something so that you know what to do in which situation. And that's why, especially now that the standards are fluid, because we're, we're learning so many new things about uh, these diseases and, and the virus. And so our standards, our hygiene standards, have to constantly be modified and adapt to the new scientific knowledge that's available. And that means the only way to keep everybody in the loop and make sure everybody knows that is through training and constant updating. So one of the main critical part now is how do we update our trainings? So we have to be much faster. And we're now in a, we have a system developed to be almost on time with our information. The moment the information is out, the moment we have a new standard, it's automatically updated in our system. And so all crew members can be instantaneously updated and informed with the, with the new information. And again, it's, it's about training, but more importantly, it's about knowing how to teach. What's the methodology? What's the system? Right. This is the critic. If you don't have the proper system in place, all the information that you have will be useless because you know knowledge without application is useless. So knowing something is 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 not yet the application. So how do you now get the information to the crew and then help them to to adapt and and use that information in the actual uh, real life uh, situation? All right. So. Uh, as uh, Aida being one of the leaders of the cruise ship industry, how, how is the company uh, coping with this pandemic and uh, how are you, uh, how are you uh, preparing? Yes, so what happens is we, we developed a online training, uh, uh, a COVID-19 specific online training with the latest standards uh, that, that we have on our ships. And we have different avenues. We have an online training that can be done for all crew and is mandatory for all crew. But on top of this, we looked in the different countries, what is the situation on the ground? And uh, here in Manila, we were able to, together with you, to come up with with a health and hygiene training plan on how to teach safely in, in the classroom again. So we have that option available, so we updated our module on this. So we have multiple options. We can train online. We have even something called a hybrid training. We came up with a hybrid, and we did this also here in Manila with Mika, where we were training crew 
from Mika with a trainer in a live classroom setting, but for crew in Indonesia. So, so that was also for us a first, but so we have a pure online training, we have a hyper training, we have classroom trainings, we have refresher trainings. So we're using everything available in our arsenal so that we can be ready for every request that we're getting from, from, uh, from Rostock in, regard, in regards to how to prepare the crew for sending them. So we're, we're using every, every available system. Why? Because in October now, we're going to start with the first cruising. So the first ship is going to sail October 17. We're going to have the first cruises again. And then we're going to start November, Yay! December. <laughs> so it looks like we're going to be with five ships. Uh, hey. October, November, December, we're going to have five ships in operation again. And wow, that's nice. It's so reassuring to hear that. Can you say that again, please? Five, five ships. Five We're, ships in November, beautiful. So in total, October, October, November, December. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna do uh, European cruises in October. Then we, we're looking into the Canary Islands cruises. Uh, we also do Western Mediterranean cruises and we're gonna go to the Middle East from Dubai. So that's staggered. So we start with October with one ship, then November the next couple of ships, then December. So by the end of the year, the goal is to have five ships in operation again. Wow. That's very good to know, Walter. It's amazing how uh, AIDA used this time to prepare uh, with training and, uh, and uh, preparing the people. Because like you said, this COVID-19 is very fluid. So everything has to be, we have to be very up, be updated. Uh, what are the new protocols for the guests and of course our crew members? What are the new things that they have to go through? If you can talk about that. Mm. All the crew members, of course, they're first gonna get trained um, uh, and then they have to go and get a COVID test uh, and they will be quarantined before they uh, leave for, for the ships. And, and then, uh, since everybody, whoever is negative tested, will then be able to go to, to the ships and they will test them again. Test them again. To go to the ships. And so there's many, many layers of hygiene layers that are always uh, in, in, uh, with the latest information, also with the local governments. So there's always that exchange between the cruise line and the local governments to make sure we follow all hygiene regulations uh, in each country. And then when the crew is safe on the ship, um, we changed a little bit uh, the service. Of course, there will be more uh, on the table service. There will be less buffet, um, more, more table service. Of course, we have sanitizers everywhere. Uh, we have, you know, state of the art air conditioning systems. And I mean, the, the whole operation is, is really, really, you know, done in a way that gives you maximum protection for the crew and the guests. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I heard that the, the German government and uh, the local government, and Correct. A lot of, uh, everybody's involved. is also involved in making sure that the comeback is safe for both the guests and the crew. And you know, uh, no. For example, we even implemented in October now that in the get in the price of the guest for the cruise, the COVID test is included. That the crew that the guests can can have a COVID test first before they come on board, so that everybody feels safe. It's like we're creating a, a bubble. We're creating a bubble on the ship. The NBA bubble. The NBA, the UFC bubble. You right, right. I, I, rem uh, I remember in uh, the beginning of our talk, you were talking about the importance of not just, this is not about procedures, it's, this is about the mentality. With this COVID pandemic, the mentality of uh, a lot of the people around the world is, um, is fear, you know? And we're discussing about uh, how fear can really destroy world economies. And I, I noticed that the the governments, the leaders of the governments who, because we're technically in recession and some governments are really pumping money. And uh, I guess, I believe that history would tell us that that's the way to go. And uh, being afraid and not doing anything is a recipe for your failure and for really burning down and dying as an industry. Let me give you an analogy on this. All right. well, the first thing I did when I arrived in, in, in Germany, 
and I knew they're gonna go into a lockdown phase, which means for me the gyms are gonna close. Okay. The first thing I did, I bought uh, 50, one, 150 kilos of extra weights, Olympic bars. I bought everything I need to buy. I spent money. I knew it's going to be tough times, but I spent money to upgrade my basement. Number one. The first thing I did when I came back to the Philippines, I took some money in my hand and I, and I bought, I don't know how many, uh, hundreds of pounds of weights and everything oh, wow. to make sure I bought extra kettlebells for my for my bedroom so I have mats on the floor I have kettlebells I have everything why why this is a this is a health crisis my philosophy was always to have the best possible quality of life be healthy I eat healthy I don't drink alcohol I never did I don't smoke I exercise regularly for me, it's all about health and fitness and, and live the best possible life. So now we're having a health crisis. There's a threat of, of something that can affect your health. So my philosophy is I have to be in the best possible shape to fight this off. There's, there's no vaccine, there's nothing yet. So what do I have? I have my body, I have my body. I need to make sure my body is in the best possible shape to fight that virus. Right. And so that's why for me, during a pandemic, the solution cannot be not to do anything, just sit on the couch and be afraid. No, I actually upped my training. I went from four or five times a week to the, uh, training. Now I'm training seven days a week again. Why? Because also in this kind of situation, you're spending more time, uh, you know, sitting around. You're not going out. You're not doing so many things. So that means your calories are going to go down. Your body is going to slow down. Metabolism is going to slow down. Plus, it's depressing, and, and being depressed makes you sick. So for me, the point is, in this type of crisis, you're not slowing down. You're not going everything down. No, you go up. You train more, you, you, you're more focused, you're more active so that your mind is at ease, that you feel again strong, you help your body, you eat even more healthy. That's my philosophy and that philosophy transfers into every aspect of life. So if we're talking about training, should we now shut down training or should we invest more in training? Well, what's my answer? Wrap it up. <laughs> of course. So, you know what, guys, you know, if you're hearing this conversation, you gotta go check out Walter Kunert's new YouTube. No. I, I watch it. No, I mean, that's a lot of weights, you know, but uh, personally, when we talked about this, you know, during the pandemic, I started uh, doing my, I, I don't do things like you do, but I started doing the walks and the calisthenics. They, uh, like what you said, it's, it's uh, doing something personal to yourself to improve but it's also about what do you do during this crisis this is this is really a test of character and 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 those who will survive are those that will do something about it we're not saying to disregard no. this pandemic we're not saying that absolutely we're not saying that we're respecting it that's why we are doing something about it correct we're doing this podcast our, our podcast was supposed to be face to face but we don't want to to do that with our face mask and I want to see you so we're doing this online so we're respecting the situation but we're also being flexible and adapting to to it in such a way that you're not afraid and frozen just saying that uh, this time of uh, fear and uncertainty is a time to be more active and more positive but respecting the situation by being careful so you have a very good new protocol and guest for crew. The question is this, what's gonna happen to the cruise industry? What do you think? Is there still job opportunities for Filipinos? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think now it's, it's, it's just a matter of adapting to the new situation. And um, the way I look at it, it's still gonna be this year, of course, a little bit slower. And then we will see next year, um, I would say step by step, the idea is to, to bring more and more ships online again. And uh, then, of course, uh, I, I'm not one of these people who sit around and say, oh, let's wait for the vaccine, you know? 
So, <laughs> you know, maybe it's coming, maybe it's not coming, but that's not in our control. So the, the thing that we it's need control to control what we can control. Exactly. And I think that's the critical part. So we're going to make our ships as safe as possible so that all the crew and the guests uh, are happy and comfortable. And then we will improve each cruise, will give us the new, give us ideas and give us uh, ways to improve it even further. And then we see next year, then hopefully we can, uh, as countries are start to open up, uh, we will get more itineraries again and, and we, will, uh, we will go back. Um, that's going to be a process. We're also going to have a new ship coming out by the end of next year. So the idea for us is we, we know this is a difficult time, but we adapt, we overcome, and then step by step we're going to bring our ships online. And I think the outcome should be we should be stronger and better than we were ever before. Because we went through a crisis, we managed it, we understood it, we know how to do things better and that can help us forward also uh, into the future. And even let's say in five years or ten years, we will maybe still use procedures that we learned during this time that we realized are valuable procedures uh, that, that will be uh, good to keep and to, to keep implemented. So. I see a crisis as an opportunity to get better, and, and I think that's the way you need to look at it. I, I just took September 22, three days ago, I just found out that uh, the, the Carnival Corporation and the other cruise lines submitted to US CDC uh, their return to cruise plans, you know, and this is a major, major thing. Uh, I think uh, what you're saying is uh, there is hope in, in this situation that the industry is going to revive. There is a revival. We, we you know and I'm also one with you in you know waiting is good, but what do you do when you wait? No, you you prepare yourself. I mean human beings are social in nature. That's why we have time immemorial we have tribes. Show, social gatherings is is a is a need, you know, for us to belong and I think you know, we as a human race will find ways, find ways to go back to that kind of situation. And one way of doing that, because it's a basic need to be with another human being and to enjoy the other company, we will find ways for sure. So with that being said, and this is my final question to you. What's your advice? You know, what can you give to our Filipino seafarers who are trying to overcome anxiety? They've been, you know, it's been five months. They've been waiting. Some of them are being depressed and anxious with this pandemic. So, what's your final message to to them? Prepare. Prepare. Get ready for the phone call when you're needed. And this is what we're seeing right now because at the moment countries open up at different times and different speeds and rate so now it's the time to be very flexible the moment we see a market is is can can open again and that's where we allocate our ships and that's why it's so critical now to be ready because that call can come at any time and uh, so i know some crew members have been waiting for a long time stay ready stay fit stay healthy do everything you can because your livelihood depends on the ability to be fit and healthy and strong and that's the critical part so so you spend the time in preparing yourself and then when the call comes you're ready to rumble and you have to you, believe me it's safe to go to our ships it's safe to go to our crews so no need to to think in any way negative Think positive, prepare yourself, and get ready for, for when the phone call comes. Wow, thank you, Walter. Stay negative, but think positive. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think uh, uh, just what I got from, from our conversation is number one, the importance of training and how it affects the industry and life, but now more so because of the fluidity of the, 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 the scenario and the changing times and how the industry is preparing to come back and Aida as one of the leaders in this cruise ship industry is very much prepared and serious in making sure that the guests and crew members are safe with the new protocols and yes prepare 
prepare with the right mindset, your body, your health, and be ready when the time comes when you're called. Thank you very much, Walter, for this conversation. Thank you so much, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, another session will be done again, and uh, maybe a an update on, on what's happening. And uh, this is very important for our aspiring seafarers, those who are studying, those who are waiting, and to those who, are, um, who went back home. So it's very important to always be engaged, and this is not something that we just uh, disregard. We respect the situation, but we have to stay negative and think positive. Thank you much. Bye-bye, <laughs> bye-bye.